Now, do you think social media as a medium changed the cultural standards? And I mean it in a, have you read Neil Postman at all? Have you read like uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death? He was a social critic, technology critic, um, and wrote a lot about sort of technological determinism. So it, the ways, which is a really influential idea to a lot of my work, which is actually a little out of fashion right now in academia, but uh, the ways that the the properties and presence of technologies change things about humans in a way that's not really intended or planned by the humans themselves. And he is a, that book is all about how different communication medium, like fundamentally just changed the way the human brain understands and operates. And so he sort of gets into the what happened when the printed word was widespread and how television changed it. And this was all pre-social media. But this is one of these ideas I'm having is like what to the degree to which, and I, I get into it sometimes on, on my show, I get into a little bit, like the degree to which like Twitter in particular, just changed the way that people conceptualized what, for example, debate and discussion was. Like it introduced a rhetorical dunk culture where it's yeah. sort of more about tribes not giving ground to other tribes. And and it's like, it's a complete, it, there's different places and times when that type of discussion was thought of differently, right? Well, yeah, absolutely. But I, I tend to believe, I don't know what you think, that there's the technological solutions. Like there's literally different features in Twitter that could completely reverse that. There's so much power in the different yeah. choices yeah. that are made. And it could still be highly engaging and have very different effects, perhaps more negative, but or hopefully more positive. Yeah, so, so, so I'm trying to pull these two things apart. So there, there's these two ways social media, let's say, could change the experience of reading a, a major newspaper today. Mm -hmm. One could be a little bit more economic, right? So, so the internet made it cheaper to get news. The newspapers had to retreat to a paywall model because it was the only way they were going to survive. But once you're in a paywall model, then then what you really want to do is make your tribe, which is within the paywall, very, very happy with you. So you want to work to them. But then there's the sort of the determinist the point of view, which is yeah. the properties of Twitter, which were arbitrary. Jack and Evan, just whatever, let's just do it this way. Influenced the very way that people now understand and think right. about the world. So the, the one influenced the other, I think. Yeah. They they kind of started adjusting together. I I did this thing. I mean, I'm trying to understand this. Part of the, part of the, I've been playing with the entrepreneurial idea. There's a very particular dream I've had of a startup that this is a longer term thing uh, with has to do with artificial intelligence. But more and more, it seems like there's a, some trajectory through creating uh, social media type of technologies, very different than what people are thinking I'm doing. But uh, it's a kind of challenge to the way the Twitter is done. But it's not obvious what the best mechanisms are to still make an exceptionally engaging platform. My like clubhouse is very engaging yeah. and not have any other negative effects. I, For example, there's uh, Chrome extensions that allow you to turn off all likes and dislikes and all of that from Twitter. So you, all you're seeing is just the content. Yeah. On Twitter, that to me is creates, that's not a compelling experience at all because I still need I would argue I still need the likes to know what's a tweet worth reading. Yeah. Because I don't only have a limited amount of time, so I need to know what's valuable. It's like great Yelp yeah. reviews on tweets or yeah, something. Yeah, exactly. But I've turned off on, uh, for example, on my account on YouTube, I've turned, uh, I wrote a Chrome extension that turns off all likes and dislikes and just views. Yeah. So I don't know how many views the video gets and so yeah. on, unless it's on my phone. But Do you take like, off the recommendations? Uh, the so, no, no. So I, YouTube, some people, the distraction for YouTube is a big one for right. people. Yeah. No, I'm not worried about the distraction because I'm able to control myself on you, YouTube. You don't rabbit hole. No, I don't rabbit hole. So you have to know your demons or your addictions or whatever. Yeah. I, on YouTube, I'm okay. I don't have, I don't keep clicking. The negative feelings come from seeing the views on on stuff you've create, have created. Oh, so you don't want to see your views. Yeah. yeah. So like, I'm just like speaking to the things that I'm aware of, of myself that it yeah. are helpful and things that are not helpful emotionally. Yeah. And I feel like there should be, we need to create actually tooling for ourselves. That's not me with JavaScript, but anybody is able to create, sort of control the experience they that they have. Yeah. Well, so so my my big unified theory on social media is I'm very I'm very bearish yes. on the big platforms having a long future. You are. I think the moment. I think the moment of three or four major platforms is uh, not going to last. Mm. 
right? So I don't know. Oh, okay, this is just perspective, right? So you can start shorting these stocks uh, <laughs> on, on my. Don't tell. It's not lad. financial advice. Yeah, yeah. Don't do Robinhood. Um, so here's here's I think the the big mistake the major platforms made is when they they took out the network effect advantage, mm-hmm. right? So the original pitch, especially of something like Facebook or Instagram, was the people you know are on here. Right. So like what you use this for is you can connect to people that you already know. This is what makes the network useful. We So therefore, the value of our network grows uh, quadratically with the number of users. And therefore, it's such a head start that there's no way that someone else can catch up. Mm-hmm. But when they shifted and when Facebook took the lead of, say, we're going to shift towards a newsfeed model, mm-hmm. they basically said, we're going to try to, in the moment, get more data and get more likes. Like what we're going to go towards is actually just uh, seeing interesting stuff. Mm-hmm. Like seeing diverting information. So people took this social internet impulse to connect to people digitally to other tools, like group text messages and WhatsApp and stuff like this, right? So you don't think about these tools as, oh, this is where I connect with people. Once it's just a feed that's kind of interesting, now you're competing with everything else that can produce interesting content that's diverting. Mm-hmm. And I think that is a a much fiercer competition because now, for example, you're going up against podcast, right? I mean, like, okay, I guess, you know, the Twitter feed is interesting right now. Um, but also a podcast is interesting or something else could be interesting too. I think it's a much fiercer competition when there's no there's no more network effects, right? And so my sense is we're going to see a fragmentation into what I call long tail social media, hmm. where if I don't need everyone I know to be on a platform, then why not have three or four bespoke platforms I use where it's a thousand people and it's all, we're all interested in, you know, whatever, AI or comedy. And it, we've, we've, perfected this interface and maybe it's like clubhouse it's audio or something and, and we all pay two dollars so we don't have to worry about attention harvesting and that's going to be wildly more entertaining like i mean i'm thinking about comedians on twitter mm-hmm. it's not the best internet possible format for them expressing themselves and being interesting that you have all these comedians that are trying to like well i can do like little clips and little whatever like i don't know if there was a long tail social media islands. Really, this is where the comedians are and there's podcast and the comedians are on podcast now. So this is my thought is that there's really no, there's really no strong advantage to having one large platform that everyone is on. If mm-hmm. all you're getting from it is I now have different options for diversion and, and like uplifting and aspirational or whatever types of entertainment, that whole thing could fragment. Mm-hmm. And I think the glue that was holding together was network effects. And I don't think they realized that when network effects have been destabilized, they don't have the centrifugal force anymore mm-hmm. and they're spinning faster and faster. But is, is a Twitter feed really that much more interesting than all of these streaming services? Is it really that much more interesting than Clubhouse? Is it that much more interesting than podcast? I feel like they don't realize how unstable their ground actually is. Yeah, that's fascinating. But uh, the thing that makes Twitter and Facebook work, I mean, the, the news feed you're exactly right. Like you can just duplicate the news. Like if it's an, if it's not the social network, and it's the news feed, then why not have multiple different feeds that are more that are better at satisfying you? There's a dopamine gamification that they've figured out. Yeah. The and uh, you, so you have to whatever you create, you have to at least provide some pleasure in that same gamification kind of way. It doesn't have to have to do with scale of large social networks, but I mean, I guess you're implying that you should be able to design that kind of uh, yeah. mechanism in other forms. Or people are turning on the, that gamification. I mean, so people are getting wise to it and are getting uncomfortable about it, yeah. right? So if, if yeah. I'm offering something, there are, these exist like out sugar. here. sugar. People yeah. realize sugar is bad yeah, for you. Sugar's They're going to stop eating. Yeah. 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 Drinking a lot's great too, but it also, after a while, you yeah. realize there's there's problems. So some of the long tail social media networks that are out there that I've looked at, they offer usually like a deeper sense of connection. Like it's usually interesting people that you share some affinity and you have these carefully cultivated. I wrote this New Yorker piece a couple of years ago about the indie social media movement that really got into some of these different you know, technologies. But I think the technologies are a distraction. We, we focus too much on, you know, Mastodon versus, you know, whatever, like forget or Discord. Like actually, let's forget the protocols right now. It's the idea of, okay, and there's all the, a lot of these long tail social media groups, what people are getting out of it, which I think can outweigh the dopamine gamification is strong connection and motivation. Like you're in a group with other guys that are all trying to be, you know, better dads or something like mm-hmm. this. And, and you talk to them on a regular basis and you're sharing your stories and there's interesting talks. And that's a powerful thing too. One interesting thing about scale of Twitter is you have these viral spread of information 
So sort of uh, Twitter has become a newsmaker in itself. Yeah, I think it's so, a problem. <laughs> well, yes, but I wonder what replaces that because because then you immediately reporting. Well, no, I mean, from, <laughs> the reporters would have to do some work again. I don't know. No, the problem with reporters and journalism is that they're they're intermediary. They have control. I mean, this is the problem in, in Russia currently. Is that you you have. Uh, it creates a shield between the, the people and the news. The The interesting thing and the powerful thing about Twitter is that the news originates from the individual that's creating the news. Like you, you have the president of the United States, the former president of the United States on Twitter creating news. You have Elon Musk creating news. You have people announcing stuff yeah. on Twitter as opposed to talking to a journalist. And that feels much more genuine and uh, it's, it it feels very powerful, but actually c coming to realize it, it it doesn't need the social network. You can just put that announcement on a YouTube type this thing. Is, this is what I'm thinking, right? So this is my point about that because that's right. It, it the the democratizing power of the internet is fantastic. I'm, I'm I'm an old school internet nerd, a guy that was you know telnetting in the servers and gophering before nice. the World Wide Web was around, right? So I'm a huge internet booster, and that's that's one of its big power. But when you put everything on Twitter. I think the fact that you've, you've taken, uh, you homogenized everything, right? So everything looks the same, moves with the same low friction, is very difficult. You have no what I call distributed curation, right? The only curation that really happens, there's a little bit with likes and also the algorithm. But if you look back to pre-Web 2.0 or early Web 2.0, when a lot of this was happening, let's say on blogs, where people own their own servers and you had your different blogs, there was this distributed curation that happened where in order for your blog to get on people's radar. And this had nothing to do with any gatekeepers or legacy media. It was over time, you got more links and people respected you and you would hear about this blog over here. And there's this whole distributed curation and filtering going on. So if you think like the 2004 presidential election, uh, most of the information people are getting from the internet was one of the first big internet news driven elections was from, you know, you had like the Daily Costs and and mm -hmm. Drudge, but there was like blogs that were out there. And, and this was back, Ezra Klein was just running a blog out of his, uh, you know, a dorm room at this point, right? And you would, in a distributed fashion, gain credibility because, okay, I people have paid, it's very hard to get people to pay attention to your blog. They're paying attention. I get linked to this kid Ezra or whatever. It seems to be really sharp. And now people are, are noticing it. And now you have a distributed curation that solves a lot of the problems we see when you have a completely homogenized, low friction environment like friction, where, mm -hmm. I mean, Twitter, where any random conspiracy theory or whatever that people like can just shoot through and spread. Whereas if you're starting a blog to try to push QAnon or something like that, it's probably going to be a really weird looking blog. And you're going to have a hard time. Like, it's just never going to show up on people's radar, well, right? I mean, that, my, that, yeah. so everything you've said up until the very last statement, I would I would agree with. I, it, <laughs> this is a topic I don't know a ton about, I guess. So QAnon, the, there's, yeah. uh, I think, uh, forget QAnon. Uh, yeah, no, we, uh, we can. But QAnon is, yeah. QAnon could be that. I also don't know. I should know more. I apologize. I don't know more. I mean, that's the power and uh, the downside you can have, I mean, uh, Hitler could have a blog today yeah. and he would have potentially a very large following if he's charismatic, if he's yeah. has, you know, is good with words, is able to express the ideas, whatever, maybe he's able to channel the frustration, the anger that people have about a certain thing. And so th I think that's the power of blogs, but it's also the limitation, but that doesn't, we're not trying to solve that. The, well, you can't the, solve that, yeah. The fundamental problem yeah. you're saying is not the problem. The, your your thesis is that there's nothing special about large scale social networks that guarantees that they will keep existing. And it, it, it's important to remember for a lot of the older generation of internet activists, so the people who were very pro internet in the early days, they were completely flabbergasted by the rise of these platforms. Say, so why would you take the internet and then build your own version of the internet? where you own all the servers. Mm -hmm. And we, we built this whole distributed, the whole thing, we had open protocols. Uh, everyone anywhere in the world can use the same protocols. Your machine can talk to any other machine. It's the most de democratic communication system that's ever been built. And then these companies came along and said, we're gonna build our own, we'll just own all the servers and put them in buildings that we own. And the internet will just be the, the first mile to just get you into our private internet where we owned the whole thing. It w went completely against the entire motivation of the internet was like, yes, we. it's not going to be one person owns all the servers and you pay to access them. It's any one server that they own can talk to anyone else's server mm -hmm. because we all agree on a standard set of protocols. And so the, the old guard of pro-internet people, 
never understood this move towards let's build private versions of the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll build three or four private internets and that's what we'll all use. It was the opposite, basically. Well, it's funny enough, I don't know if you follow, but Jack Dorsey is also uh, is a proponent and, and is helping to fund, create fully distributed versions of Twitter, essentially a thing yeah. that would potentially destroy Twitter. Yeah. But I think there, you know, there might be financial art, like business cases to be made there, I'm not sure. But that seems to be another alternative as, as opposed to creating a bunch of uh, like the long tail, uh, creating like the ultimate long tail of like fully distributed. Yeah, which, which is which is what the internet is. But actually. that's that's sort of my long. When I'm thinking about long tail social media. I'm thinking it's uh, like the tech's not so important. Like there's groups out there, right? I, I know where the tech they use to actually implement their digital only social group, whatever. They might use Slack. They might right. use some combination of Zoom, or it doesn't matter. I think in, in the tech world. We want to build the beautiful protocol right. that, okay, everyone's going to use as just a federated server protocol in which we've worked out X, Y, and Z, and no one understands it because then the engineers need it all to make. I get it because I'm a nerd like this. Like, okay, every standard has to fit with everything else, and no one understands what's going on. Meanwhile, you know, you have this group of bike enthusiasts that are like, yeah, we'll just jump on a Zoom and have some Slack and put up a blog. The tech doesn't really matter. Like, we built the world with our own curation, our own rules. Uh, our own sort of social ecosystem that's generating a lot of value. I, mean, I, don't, can, I don't know if it'll happen. There's a lot of money at stake with obviously these large, but I just think they're more, they're so, I mean, look how quickly Americans left Facebook, right? I mean, Facebook was savvy to buy other properties and, the, and to yeah. diversify, right? But how quick did that take for just standard Facebook news feed? Oh, yeah. Everyone of, under the age of something were using it and no one under a certain age is using it now. It took like four years. I mean, this stuff is yeah, really- I, see, I believe- you people can leave Facebook overnight. Yeah, like I, I think uh, Facebook hasn't actually messed up, for, like enough to. Uh, there's two things they haven't messed up enough for people to really leave aggressively, and yeah. there's no good alternative for for them to leave. I think if good alternatives pop up, it will just immediately happen. The stuff is a lot more culturally fragile. I think. I mean, Twitter's having a moment because it was feeding a certain type of. I mean, there's a lot of anxieties that was in the the sort of political sphere, anyways. That Twitter was working with mm -hmm. um but its moment could go to as well i mean it's a really arbitrary thing short little things and i read a wired article about this earlier in the pandemic like this is crazy that the way that we're trying to communicate information about the pandemic is all these weird arbitrary rules where people are screenshotting pictures of articles that are part of a tweet thread where you say one slash yeah. in under it like we have the technology guys to, yeah. to like really clearly convey in for long form information to people like why are we why do we have these and i know it's because it's the gamified dopamine hits but what a weird medium there's no reason for us to have to have these threads that you have to find and pin with you screenshot. I mean, we have technology to communicate better using the internet. I mean, why are epidemiologists having to do tweet threads? Well, because there's mechanisms of publishing that make it easier on Twitter. I mean, we're evolving yeah. as a species and the internet is a very fresh thing. Yeah. And so it's kind of interesting to think that as opposed to Twitter, it's, this is what Jack also complains about is Twitter's not innovating fast enough. Yeah. And, so it's almost like the people are innovating and thinking about their productive life faster than the platforms on which they operate can catch up. Yeah. And so at the point you, the gap grows sufficiently, they'll jump. A few people, a few innovative folks will just create an alternative and uh, perhaps distributed, uh, perhaps just many little silos and then people will jump and then we'll just continue this kind of way. Yeah, but see, I, I think like Substack, for example, what they're going to pull out of Twitter, among other things, is the audience that was, let's say, like slightly left of center, but um, slightly left of center, don't like Trump, uncomfortable with like postmodern critical theories made into political yes. action, right? And they're like, yeah, Twitter, there was a, people on there talking about this and it made me feel sort of heard because I was feeling a little bit like yeah. a nerd about it. But honestly, I'd probably rather subscribe to four subs. You know, I'm going to have yeah. like Barry's and Andrew Sullivan's. I'll have like a Jesse Signals. Like I'll have a few sub stacks I can subscribe to. And honestly, that's, I'm a knowledge worker who's 32 anyways, probably that's an email all day. And yeah. and so like there's an innovation that's going to, that group, you know, yep. it's going to suck them off. Which is actually a very large group. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of, that's a lot of energy. And then once Trump's gone, I guess that's probably going to drive, that drove a lot of, uh, uh, more like Trump people off Twitter. Like this stuff is fragile, I so think. I de but the fascinating thing to me, because I've hung out on Parler for a short amount enough 
to to know that the interface matters. It's so fascinating, like that yeah. that it's not just about ideas. Yeah, uh, it's about creating like Substack to creating a pleasant experience, uh, addicting experience. No, you're right. You're right about that, and it's hard. And it's yeah, why the it's this, right. is, this is one of the conclusions from that indie social media article is it's just the ugliness matters. And I don't mean even just aesthetically, but just the clunkiness of the interfaces, the, um, and I don't know, it's it, to some degree, the social media companies have spent a lot of money on this mm-hmm. and to some degree it's a survivorship bias. Yeah. Right. I think Twitter, every time I hear Jack talks about this, it seems like he's as surprised as anyone else, mm-hmm. the way Twitter is being used. I mean, it's basically the way, you know, they had it, uh, years ago. And then, you know, it was like, great. It'll be statuses, right? Yeah. This is what I'm doing you know, and my friends can follow me and see it. And without really changing anything, it just happened to hit everything right yeah. to support this other type of interaction. Well, there's also the JavaScript model, which uh, Brendan Ike talked about. He just implemented JavaScript, uh, like the crappy version of JavaScript in 10 days, threw it out there and just uh, changed it really quickly. Yeah. Evolved it really quickly. And now has become, uh, according to Stack Exchange, the most popular programming language in the world. It, yeah. it drives like most of the internet and even the back end, and now mobile. And, yeah. and so that that's an argument for the kind of thing you're talking about where like like the bike club people yeah. <laughs> could literally create the thing that would uh, you know run most of the internet yeah. in 10 years from now. Yeah. yeah. So th- there's something to that. like as opposed to trying to get lucky or trying to think through stuff is just to uh, to solve a particular problem. Do stuff, yeah. And then do stuff. Do stuff, so- like, keep tinkering until you love it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, and of course the sad thing is timing and luck matter and that you can't really control. Yeah, that's the problem, yeah. But- uh, You can't go back to 2007. Yeah. That, that's like the number one thing you could do to have a lot of success with a new platform is go back in time yeah. 14 years. <laughs> so the, the thing you have to kind of think about is what is the, like what's the totally new thing that uh, 10 years from now would seem obvious. I mean, some people saying Clubhouse is that, it, there's been a lot of stuff like Clubhouse before, yeah. but it it hit the right kind of thing. Uh, similar to Tesla actually, what Clubhouse did is it got a lot of re- relatively famous people on there quickly. Yeah. And um, and then the the other effect is like, it's invite only, so like, oh, all the smart, like, famous people are on there. I wonder what's it's the FOMO, like, fear that you're missing something really profound, or exciting happening there. So those social effects, and then once you actually show up, I'm a huge fan of this. It's the JavaScript model. Is like, Clubhouse is so dumb, like so simple in its interface. Like you literally can't do anything except mute, unmute. There's a mute button, yeah, and there's a leave quietly button, yeah, and that's it, <laughs> yeah, and that's it's kind of. I love single use technology. That, yeah, that that there, sense, yeah. There's no like, there's no. It's yeah. just like trivial, and uh, you know, Twitter kind of started like that. Facebook started like that, yeah. But they've evolved quickly to add all these features and so on. And you know, I do hope Clubhouse stays that way. Yeah, It'd be interesting. Or, or, there, or there's alternatives. I mean, I, I mean, even with Clubhouse, though. The, the so one of the issues with a lot of these platforms, I think, is uh, bits are cheap enough now hmm. uh, that we don't really need a unicorn investor model. I mean, the the investors need that model. But there's really not really an imperative of we need something that can scale to 100 million plus a year revenue. So, because it was going to require this much seed and angel investment, and and you're not going to get this much seed and angel investment unless you can have a potential exit this this wide, because you have to be part of a portfolio that depends on one out of ten exiting here. If you don't actually need that, and you don't need to satisfy that investor model, which I think is basically the case. I mean, bits are so cheap, everything is so cheap. You don't necessarily. So even like with Clubhouse, it's it's, it's investor backed, right? It's this notion of like this needs to be a major platform. Um, but the bike club doesn't necessarily need a major platform. That's where I'm interested. I mean, I don't know. I, there, there's so much money. That's the only problem that bets against me is that you can concentrate a lot of capital if you do these things right. Yeah. I mean, so Facebook was like a, a fantastic capital concentration machine. It's crazy how much, where it even found that capital in the world that it could concentrate and ossify in the stock price that a very small number of people have you know access to, right? That's that's incredibly powerful. So when there when there is a possibility to 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 consolidate and gather a huge amount of capital, that's a huge imperative. That's very hard for the bike club to go up against. So, but there's a lot of money in the bike club. If you see what the Wall Street uh, bets, 
Yeah. When, that, when a bunch of people get together, I yeah. mean, it doesn't have to be a bike, it could be a bunch of different bike clubs, just kind of team up yeah. uh, to overtake. That's what we're doing now. Yeah. yeah. Or we're going to repurpose off the shelf stuff. Yes. That's not, that you were going to, yeah, we're going to repurpose whatever it was for office productivity or something. And right. like the, the clubs using Slack just to build out these, you know, yeah. 